Well, amen. Now, see, I told you not to miss tonight, didn't I? I did. Well, I don't believe Larnell Harris and Sandy Patty could have beat that. That was wonderful, wonderful. That was worth coming out in the rain for. Well, I hear the rain, so I'm assuming all the ball games are going to be canceled, and uh, that won't bother me a bit. I'll take a half a baby aspirin and sleep all night. But I am, I am so glad you're here. Thank you so much for coming. I had the opportunity this morning to speak to your local pastor's conference, and, and I love to preach to preachers. I love preachers. I are one, and I enjoy just hanging out with them, and I thank God for them. Brother Junior Hill, who's an evangelist from Hartsville, Alabama, he's, the, he's really the dean of Southern Baptist Evangelists. He's been doing it a long, long time. Brother Junior Hill says, I never met a preacher that I didn't like. He said, and I have come dangerously close, but I never met a preacher that I didn't like. And I just love being with preachers, and I've enjoyed Brother David Lawler's here again tonight. My wife and I are members of the Highland Park Baptist Church in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and our youngest son, Brett, is the pastor there. Uh, I tell folks I'm the only man in the church that ever whipped the pastor. <clears throat> and I did. That's why he's such a good guy now. But... Uh, Brother David used to pastor Highland Park Baptist Church in Muscle Shoals years ago, and so we're now living on the dividends of his good and faithful ministry there. But thank you for coming. Well, take your Bible, if you will, please, and turn to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. Now, let me, let me tell you something I know about you. Now, I know we have some visitors tonight, and and thank you for, for coming. Now, if you've never stood in this pulpit, it's, it's an unusual pulpit because uh, all of these lights are directed right at here. And when you wear glasses, all you see is glare. And so I can't see a lot of you face to face. So I don't know if, uh, how many of you are members and how many of you are visitors. And if you're a visitor... If I'm supposed to know you, I probably do if I could see you, all right? <laughs> but uh, having said that, those of you who are members here, I can tell you what I know about you. If you have come out on Monday night in the rain to be in service, you are the best this church has. Now, I'm just being honest. If you've come out on a rainy Monday night to be in revival service, you're the best this church has. I mean, as sorry as you are, you're the best this church has. <laughs> I don't want you to get it puffed up about it, but, but I, I do thank you. But I want to talk to you tonight about something that's near and dear to my heart. I want to talk to you about revival. Revival is, is a great need, and I want to just talk to you a little bit about Isaiah chapter 44, verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant. O Israel, thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth, and break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and hath glorified himself in Israel. As a, as a traveling, wandering preacher going from place to place, let me tell you what I hear an awful lot. A lot of times when I go into a church, especially if I've never been there before, but uh, many of the places I go now I have been before, but, but I still hear it. This is what I hear. Brother Bob, we need revival. Brother Bob, our church, we really, really need revival. I hear that almost everywhere I go. Brother Bob, we need revival. And sometimes I hear this, Brother Bob, they need revival. <laughs> Man, Brother Bob, our old people, they need revival. Brother Bob, our choir, their dead is 4 o'clock. They need revival. Brother Bob, our young people, while they're so shiftless, they need revival. And so I hear a lot, we need revival, and they need revival, but I never hear anybody say, I need revival. 
And I find that so very, very interesting because revival is an intimately personal experience. Revival does not happen a denomination at a time. Revival does not even happen a church at a time. Revival happens an individual at a time. Now what that means simply is this. You can have revival whether anybody else does or not. You can have revival whether the church does or not. Because revival is intensely a personal work of God in an individual life. Now having said that, if you are going to experience revival in your heart this week, two things have to take place. Number one, you have to be honest enough to admit it. And that's hard for a lot of Baptists to do. Sometimes we're kind of like the church at Laodicea. We've got everything we need. We, we don't need anything. And sometimes it's hard for folks just to be honest and say, Lord, I need revival. And so if you're going to experience revival, you have to be honest enough to admit that you need it. And secondly, you have to be desperate enough to want it. I've been preaching 51 years, and I, I want to tell you something, I, a conclusion that I've reached. I've come to the conclusion that God only works in the lives of desperate people. You and I live today in, a, in an age of casual Christianity. Folks will come to church when they don't have anything else to do. We are so casual about our profession of faith in the Lord Jesus today. But I don't think God really cares much about that. God works in the lives of desperate people. Jesus said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they, and hey, only they, shall be filled. As I travel around, I don't see a lot of people hungering and thirsting for the things of God. But every once in a while, I run across someone, and it's obvious they are absolutely desperate for a fresh encounter with God. And so if you want revival in your life, I'm talking about you as an individual, if you want revival in your life, you can experience it. You can if you're honest enough to admit that you need it and you're desperate enough to want it. Now that's the introduction. Now I want us to look at the text. These verses that I have read for you, the word revival does not appear in them, but I promise you that's what these verses are talking about. It gives to us some of the key words, key phrases of revival. First of all is the word remember. Revival comes first through remembering. Look what he says in verse 21. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel. You remember the church in, uh, that Jesus wrote to, the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation chapter 2? Jesus wrote a letter to that church and he said this. He said, I know your works. Man, you're a blowing, going church. You're just always doing and working and, and nobody could ever find any fault with you. Nobody could ever criticize you for being a lazy church. You are constantly, constantly working. You are a working church. And not only are you a working church, Jesus said, hey, you're also a doctrinally sound church. You cannot bear those that preach false doctrine. You, you, you don't allow that to go on in your church. You are as straight as a gun barrel theologically. You're sound in your belief. But Jesus said, even though you are doctrinally sound and even though you're a hardworking church, he said, nevertheless, I have something against you. And this is what he had against them. He said, 
you have left your first love. You know what that means? It means you don't love me like you used to. I was a pastor for 33 years. The last 20 of those was at Kirby Woods in Memphis. In all of the years that I was a pastor, I can't even begin to count the number of times a person would come into my office. Sometimes it would be a man, and he would say, Brother Bob, my, my wife, she doesn't love me like she used to. Sometimes it would be a lady and she would say, Brother Bob, my husband doesn't love me like he used to. Sometimes parents would come in and say, Brother Bob, our, our children don't love us like they used to. And a few times there were teenagers that came and said, Brother Bob, our, our, my mama and my daddy don't love me like they used to. Now that always grieved my heart when people said something like that to me. But how much sadder it is when when Jesus says to his church, you don't love me like you used to. And you remember what he said right after he told them that? He said, remember. You see, if you're going to have a revival, God says there are some things you need to remember. And he doesn't just leave us a vacuum of wondering about what those are. He gives us a list right here. First of all, God says, I want you to remember where you came from. Look what he says there in verse 21. He says, remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. And notice this, I have formed thee. Do you know why you exist? You exist because God wills you to exist. You're not the product of biological reproduction. You're not the product of evolutionary process. You exist. You are alive. You are a person because God formed you. Now, you may have your daddy's eyes and you may have your mother's smile and you may have your Aunt Susie Mae's gossiping tongue. But I'm telling you, regardless of who you may look like or favor in your appearance, you were formed by God. You would not even exist if it were not for him. And so God says, I want you to remember where you came from. Secondly, God says, I want you to remember what I've done for you. And look what he says in verse 22. He said, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. God said, I have blotted out your transgressions. The word transgressions here refers to the individual acts of sin that we have committed. It may be lust, it may be lying, it may be hatred, it may be bigotry, it may be murder or whatever. But the word transgressions refers to all of those individual acts of sin that we have personally committed. And God said, I blotted them out. That expression blotted out literally means to rub out or to remove or to erase. The Bible gives us three pictures of what God has done with our sins. First of all, the Bible tells us that God has taken our sins and has placed them in the middle of his back. Have you ever tried to see the middle of your back? Even an Indian rubber man can't turn his neck that far. And when it says that he has taken our sins and put them in the middle of his back, it simply means that God has put our sins in a place where he no longer sees them. Another place the Bible says that God has taken our sins and has removed them from us as far as the east is from the west. Now I ask you, how far is the east from the west? There's no way to measure that. Now, if he had said as far as the north from the south, we could measure that. If you were to go outside of this building tonight and take a compass and start walking north, it would take you a long time. But eventually you'd come to the North Pole and the minute you passed it, you'd be heading south. And you could walk and walk and walk and walk and walk and eventually you'd pass the South Pole and you'd be heading north. You can measure north from south, but you can go to Memphis, Tennessee and get on an airplane, head west, and you can circle the globe 40 times heading west. 
Or you can get on an airplane heading east and you can circle the globe 40 times and all you'll do is head east. There's no way to measure east from west. And so God said, I have taken your sins and have removed them from you an immeasurable distance. Another place the Bible says God has taken our sins and has cast them into the depths of the deepest sea. Now how deep is the deepest sea? I don't know. I don't even care. Now I'm sure there's some oceanographers that know exactly how deep the deepest sea is, but it's just a picture. John Jasper was one of the great preachers of yesteryear. John Jasper was, a, was an African-American preacher and uh, he was a descendant of the slaves and he pastored a mega church before there was any such thing as a mega church. He would preach to about 4,000 people every Sunday morning. 2,000 of them would be white, 2,000 of them would be black, and they would all come together to hear him preach the Word of God. Now, he absolutely butchered the king's English. You can read his books and you can tell that's very obvious. He butchered the English language, but I tell you when he stood and preached, he preached with the power of God on his life. One day he was in his office studying the word of God and, and his little secretary was sitting outside of his office in her office and all of a sudden she heard a great commotion and she heard some, some things uh, rattling and some, some shouting and she, she got worried about him and she opened the door and she said, uh, Brother John, are you okay? He said, I'm fine, I'm fine. He said, I was just reading here in the Bible where God has taken my sin and cast him into the depths of the deepest sea. And he said, I got to thinking about that. If the old devil was to go down and try to drag him up, he'd drown before he got to the top. <laughs> so which is it? Has God taken our sins and put them in the middle of his back? Or has God taken our sins and removed them as far as the east is from the west? Or has God taken our sins and cast them in the depths of the deepest sea? Yes, just pick one. Doesn't make a difference. They're all just pictures. God has blotted out our transgression. The old song says, you ask me why I'm happy, I will tell you why. Because my sins are gone. God says, I have blotted out your sins. But he also says, not only have I blotted out your transgressions, he says, I have blotted out your sins. Now, the, sometimes in the Bible, the word transgressions and the word sins kind of mean the same thing. But here it's not so. The word transgressions refers to those individual acts of sin that we committed. But the word sins here in verse 22 refers to the penalty that comes from being a sinner. I shared with the pastor's conference this morning that sin always has a penalty. Sin always has a penalty. The Old Testament says the soul that sinneth shall surely die. The New Testament says the wages of sin is death. But it's not just talking about physical death. It's talking about eternal death to be cast into the lake of fire, which is what the Bible calls the second death. And those who die without Christ, that's what happens to them. But those of us who are Christians, that penalty has been blotted out. If you're a child of God, you're not going to hell and you don't have to fret about that. You don't have to lay awake at night wondering about that. If you are a saved person, God says right here, I have blotted out all of those individual sins and I have blotted out the penalty that comes because of those sins. Hey, no wonder the hymn writer said, Hallelujah, what a Savior, amen? God said, I want you to remember what I've done for you. But not only has he blotted out our sins, look at the very last part of verse 22. He says, for I have redeemed you. The word redeem is one of the most precious words in the Bible. And it always involves the payment of a price. Redemption always involves the payment of a price. Sometimes people were slaves and if someone wanted to get them out of slavery, they had to pay a price in order to redeem that person from slavery. 
those of us who are saved, we've been redeemed. Amen. We sing it. I'm redeemed by love divine. We sing redeemed how I love to proclaim it. And yet the book of 1 Peter says this, you were not redeemed by corruptible things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without spot and without blemish. Salvation is free, but I'm telling you it's not cheap, amen? It costs God the life of his son. I have two sons. My oldest son, Vance, is those of you who were at the men's conference, you heard him this past February. My oldest son, Vance, is pastor of the Hope Baptist Church in Las Vegas, Nevada, the North American Mission Board of our denomination. Sent him out there 14 years ago to plant a church in Sin City in Las Vegas. Hey, they needed churches out there. And so God sent him out there. I, I didn't want him to go. He was carrying some of my grandchildren and he's had some since he's gotten there. I didn't want him to go, but hey, who am I? God does what he wants to do, amen? And so God sent my son and his wife and, and some of my grandchildren out to Las Vegas to Sin City to plant a church. Their first service, they had 18 people. This past Sunday, this past Easter, he had six services. He had one service Friday night, two Saturday night, three on Sunday. They had 5,000 people in those six services. They had over 100 people saved. He texted me last night. He said, Dad, today, yesterday, yesterday, he baptized 95 people. That's my oldest son. My youngest son, I've already told you, is Brad. He's my pastor, and I'm so proud of him. He's doing such a good job there. In muscle shows. That's the only two children we have, two boys. I, I had hoped one of my sons would, would become rich, make lots and lots of money so he could take care of me in my old age. And now both of them are preachers. I'll have to preach till I die. <clears throat> but I don't really mind that either. Two sons. But if I would have had to have given either one of my two sons for people to go to heaven, then friend, you'd have just had to gone to hell. I'm just being honest. I love you. It's not hard for me to love people. I really do love people. But I don't love them that much. You see, God doesn't just love people. He's so loved. God so loved the world that he gave his only he didn't have another one in the wings. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was the price for our redemption, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And we don't need to forget that. We need to stay close to that. The old hymn writer had it right. Jesus, keep me near the cross. You see, when we get away from the cross, that's when our lives begin to go astray. The cross of Christ is the price of our redemption. And so God said, I want you to remember what I've done for you. I've blotted out your sins, and I redeemed you at the expense of the life of my only Son. And third thing God says, not only do I want you to remember where you came from and remember what I've done for you, I want you to remember the promise I've made to you. Now look back up there in verse 21, the last phrase, he says, thou shall not be forgotten of me. God said, I won't ever forget you. You know, we're a, we're a forgetful people, aren't we? Some of you men, you, you may be in the past, you forgot your wife's birthday or you forgot your anniversary. But after you got out of the hospital, you've never forgotten it since, you see. But we are, we are a forgetful people. My dad died in 1991. My mother died in 1997. So they've been gone a good while. In my home, my mother was the talker. Now, I mean, my mother, could <clears throat> she could out-talk any four women I've ever known in my life. People love my mother. They say we're always coming to see her. They're always calling her on the phone. Uh, but, but my mother just loved to talk, and she talked and talked and talked and talked. And I can remember the sound of her voice as though she were speaking into my ear right now. It is crystal clear I remember the sound of her voice. 
But I'm telling you this, and I'm saying it to you to my embarrassment. I do not remember the sound of my dad's voice. Now, part of that was my mama's fault. He didn't get a chance to talk very much. My dad was a, my dad was a quiet fellow. He didn't speak a lot. But uh, I was thinking the other day, what did my dad's voice sound like? And I just don't remember what it sounded like. And again, I say that to my shame. But God said, you will never be forgotten of me. Some of you here tonight, life is the best for you it has ever been. You're walking around on the mountaintops, all the bills are paid, you've got money in the bank, you and all of your family are healthy, and life is rosy and everything's wonderful. God's not going to forget you. But there's some of you here and you're going through the most difficult time in your life. You're walking through a valley. Uh, There's nothing but thunder and lightning all around you. You're in a storm every day. You're in a deep valley in the darkest night. But God says, hey, I'm not going to forget you either. God doesn't forget us. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So God says, if you're going to have revival in your life, you've got to remember some things. You've got to remember where you came from. I formed you. You've got to remember what I've done for you. I have blotted out your sins and have redeemed you. And you need to remember the promise I made to you. I will never forsake you. And then God says, there's something else I want you to remember. I want you to remember why I saved you to start with. You ever wonder why God even puts up with us? You know, God, the Bible says, created all things. God created fish. There's not a fish God ever made that caused him any problem. God created birds. There's not a bird God ever made that caused him any trouble. God created the beast of the field, and there's not a beast of the field that ever caused him any trouble. The only thing God ever made that ever caused him any trouble is man. And that's all we've ever done is cause him grief and heartache and trouble. And yet he loves us anyhow. That's an amazing... Thank God for it. Amen? Why did God save us to start with? Well, he said it twice there in verse 21. Some of you may remember Dr. Charles Sullivan. What a wonderful man of God he is. He and his wife, Delilah, they live up in uh, uh, East Tennessee now. And uh, I love Brother Charles. He told me, I called him Saturday. I call him and check on him. They're both in pretty poor health. And I call him and check on him from time to time. And I called him Saturday coming up here. And he said, oh, yes. He said, years and years and years ago, I preached a revival at the First Baptist Church of Covington, Tennessee. But Dr. Sullivan, uh, uh, I'm about to forget what I, was, what I brought him up for, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, whatever it was, it'll come to me in a minute. But uh, God says, I want you to remember why I saved you so that you can serve me. Dr. Sullivan used to say, if God says something one time, that's enough. But if he says something two times, that's more than enough. And what we find there in verse 21, two times God says it, Thou art my servant, for I formed thee, thou art my servant. Two times God said it. You are never more like Jesus than when you are serving the Lord. Jesus said the Son of Man, and he's talking about himself. He said the Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto. He said the Son of Man came to minister. Jesus came to be a servant. The disciples didn't wash his feet. He washed their feet. And you're never more like Jesus than when you're serving God. You want a revival? Well, you have to be honest enough to admit you need it. And you have to be desperate enough to want it. But then God says there are some things you have to remember. Remember where you came from. Remember what I've done for you. Remember the promise I gave you. And remember the reason I saved you. 
And then there's a second word here. It's the word return. Look there with me, if you will, in verse 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me. Return. God's invitation to lost people is come. Come. If you ever watch Dr. Rogers' program, and I, I sure did love Dr. Rogers. He was a sweet friend. And, but if you, and he's still on, everywhere I go, all across the nation, I see him. I, I told him a few Sundays ago in Texas, I said, man, May Adrian, for a dead man, you look great. <laughs> but if you ever watch Dr. Rogers on television, when he would get through preaching, he always stepped down to the main floor, and his invitation never changed, never changed. It was always come, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus in the balcony, come to Jesus. On the left, on the right side, come to Jesus. On this side, come to Jesus. On the main floor, come to Jesus. God's invitation to unsaved people is come, come. But God's invitation to Christian people is come back. Come back. God says, return unto me. Now, that doesn't mean you've gotten off into gross sin. It doesn't mean you've started worshiping idols. It doesn't mean you've started uh, committing adultery and killing people and robbing banks. It just means you have slowly drifted away. And sometimes it is so slow and so gradual, you're not even aware that it's happening. And then all of a sudden, one day you come to the realization I'm not as close to God as I once was. And God says, come back. It's an old illustration. Every preacher in the house has used it. But there was an old man and an old lady. They lived on a farm way outside of town. And they drove an old pickup truck. The man did. They lived on this farm, and every Saturday morning they would go to town. They went to town to the drugstore to get their medicines, and they went to the grocery store to get their, all of the, their food for the week. And, and, but they always wanted to be sure they got back home before dark because they were very old and they didn't want to be on the highway at night. And so one Saturday they went into town, they went to the drugstore and got their medicine. They went over to the grocery store and got their, their groceries, and they were on their way home. All of a sudden, a, a boy, in a, a, a teenage boy in an automobile whizzed by them, just going lickety-split, and then pulled right in front of them and kept going. And, and in the car with that boy was a teenage girl, obviously his sweetheart, and she was scrooched over right next to him. And if you don't know what scrooching is, then you've never been in love, I guess. But she was just scrooched over right up against, it looked like a two-headed monster driving that car. The old lady in the truck said, Paul, we used to ride like that. And he said to her, I haven't moved. <laughs> hey, if there is a distance between you and the Lord, the Lord hasn't moved. And he says, return, come back, come back. And then there's the third key to revival, not only remember and return, and that is rejoice. If you'll remember and you'll return, good things are going to happen. You'll have a revival. Look what it says there in verse 23. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth, singing and shouting. As you read the Bible, singing and shouting are expressions of joy. Singing. Boy, I tell you, I just love to sing. I love to sing the songs of Zion. I love to hear people sing like these ladies did tonight. I love to hear choirs sing. I love good singing. If you ever watch any of those Bill Gaither videos, I've been with every one of those folks, all of them. I've either been in revival with them or in some state evangelism conference with them or somewhere, but I've been with all of them. I've heard some wonderful singing. 
I've heard some bad singing too. I mean, I've heard some folks sing a solo and they sound like a hoot owl with post-nasal drip, you know. I mean, I mean, there's some singers, they approach a note just close enough to make you want to kill somebody. But whether you can sing or not has nothing to do with it. We sing because we have a song. Amen. Singing is an expression of joy. And shouting. Now, you don't hardly ever hear it anymore. And I'll be in revival in October at a church up in Springfield, Missouri. And it's not just a little bitty country church. They run thousands and thousands of people. It's a big, big church. And, but, boy, I was up there two years ago in a revival meeting. And, had to, man, they've got an auditorium. You could, you could sink a ship in. It's so big. And I was in that church, and I heard people shouting, praising God. And when I first started out years ago as a 16-year-old preacher, I, I, I would often hear shouting. Some of these preachers that have been preaching, we used to hear that. And it wasn't that people were putting on a show. They weren't trying to draw attention to themselves. I mean, they just got so full of Jesus. If they didn't shout, they would decorate the walls with themselves. I mean, it was either shout or explode. That's just the way it was. You don't hear any shouting much anymore. One lady said, well, we've become more sophisticated now than they were back then. I said, well, that's not the word I would have used, but okay. When you're looking for an excuse, when you've lost your shout, one reason is as good as the other. But singing and shouting were expressions of joy. Where is the joy that we once knew? I remember as a, as a young person going to Highland Baptist Church in Florence, Alabama as a teenage boy. I'd go on Sunday morning, I'd go on Sunday night, I'd go back on Wednesday night. Brother, Brother Ellie Kelly was our pastor when I was a teenager, and then when he retired, Brother Jerry Helms came. And, and our church back then, it was such a happy church. And, and man, you walked in the place, and somebody would hug your neck and tell you they loved you more. It was just so much joy. I've gone to some churches to preach a revival, and nobody ever even spoke to me, and I was the guest preacher. Where's our joy? What happened to it? If you'll remember, and if you'll return, your joy will come back. You know, you don't, uh, you don't have to have good health to be a Christian. Being a Christian doesn't mean you're always going to be healthy. It doesn't mean you're always going to be wealthy. It doesn't mean you're not going to have difficult times in your life. But every Christian has a right to have a joyful heart. And that joy doesn't come by watching the comedy channel on television. That joy comes from just experiencing a fresh touch from God on your life. Revival, it happens to one believer at a time. Just one. One at a time. When they're honest enough to admit they need it, and they're desperate enough to want it, if they'll remember, and if they'll return, the rejoicing will come back. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we've come now to a time of invitation. And Lord, I, I guess this would not be called an evangelistic sermon, but Lord, I, I, I dealt with John 3.16 and talked about the price you paid to save people. And so there's been enough gospel preached here tonight to save the world. And so, Father, if there are people who've never given their heart to Jesus, I pray they had come tonight and, and tell Pastor Chuck, Pastor, I want to be saved tonight. I want to be saved. I pray they'd come. And, Lord, maybe there's a man or some men. Maybe there's a lady or some ladies. Maybe there's a teenage boy or girl. Maybe there's a little boy, a little girl who is desperate for revival in their heart. 
And I pray they'd come and ask for it at your altar here. And I believe you'll give it to them, Lord. I believe you'll, I believe you'll revive their heart and restore their joy. So I pray that people would come. I pray that pride would not be a hindrance, but those who are honest enough to admit they need it and desperate enough to want it, I pray they'd make their way to this altar as we begin to sing in a moment. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. As